Every step you take is an investment. Every decision to do the difficult thing is a gift to your future self. Think about this for a second. One of the many things that makes being human so incredible is our ability to engage in delayed gratification, to do things now that will elevate us at a future time. And at a, a fundamental level, we understand that. We've heard the famous marshmallow study where kids were left alone in a room with the marshmallow placed in front of them and the ones who showed restraint and could resist eating it ended up uh, in many regards being more successful as adults. We've all heard the mantras, working hard pays off. That's valuable. But I'd like to take it a step further. Because when you say yes in the face of adversity, when you move forward when tired, seek out a way amidst the chaos of life, you are contributing to a foundation so powerful that it will elevate you in ways outside your current level of awareness. By simply saying yes, when I was unsure and often fearful, by continuing to write and speak, I was unknowingly building these opportunities that would manifest years later, right? Many of which were not planned. They were not methodical. My dedication and my North Star never changed. I held on tightly to those, but uh, the surrounding components were always moving and transforming. People are in my life today because of steps I took five years ago. I know things about myself and my hopes and my dreams because of risks I took when I was, let's face it, too ignorant to understand their repercussions. But I knew it felt right. See, here's what I did understand. If I, as Emerson put it, hitched my wagon to a star and moved towards it, when I felt great and when I didn't, when I was confident and when I wasn't, when I was winning and when I was not, I knew the other stuff would take care of itself. I trusted the process. And here's why that matters. Here's why I'm taking you all on a little trip down memory lane. Because writing, speaking, inspiring, storytelling, they are my world within. What is yours? What is it that moves you, that lights up your soul? I want you to know that. I want you to know that because its pursuit requires not only a delayed gratification, but an acceptance that your dedication will evolve in ways so incredible that you can't even imagine. That all those little decisions become emergent and together represent something more powerful than the sum of its parts. I love the example or idea of the human brain, right? So complex and powerful that it appears almost divine. It's essentially a universe behind our eyes. Even our understanding, our comprehension is minimal. We are awed by its capability. Yet it's not about one single piece of the brain, the tissues or the neurons individually. It's the network all these microscopic occurrences create together. Something bigger than everything combined, creating a consciousness we can't even find or point to when looking at the evidence. But we know it exists, and we know it's somehow derived from this ball of nervous tissue. This is not unlike one's pursuit of excellence. The level of achievement or consciousness we are searching for, it can't be singularly identified. It's emergent. It materializes after the discipline, after the consistent work, after the self-belief, after the will to do what is required, whether we wanted to in the moment or we didn't. Then we get our quote unquote consciousness. You can't and won't always see the value in your dedication, in your sacrifice. And let me level with you. I get how crazy it feels to think, yeah, but someday it will mean something. Someday that work will put people in my life that will change my world, elevate my existence. It will create opportunities that expedite my evolution, lessons and occurrences that will amplify my wisdom and worldview. But that's the name of the game. If you know in your heart 
you are pointing to the right star, then it's just about stepping, adjusting, and repeating. Move, adjust, move, adjust, move, adjust. There will be a time when you look over your shoulder and are stunned by what you've created, by the distance you've traveled. Look, you can't see the future. You can't know what everything will mean and what will occur, but you can continue forward into the darkness so that when the long-awaited light inevitably presents itself, you are in position to receive it, to stand on the foundation you have been building all along. I put on my shoes, stepped outside, and as I made my way down the street for my midday run, I felt the wind at my back, tailwind. My first thought, well, nice, this is convenient. Especially running along the beach where it can be pretty windy, it's definitely a luxury to have wind at your back. Sure enough, my mind went, oh, but that leaves me a headwind when I turn around and come back up the coast. My mind started to wander. I started imagining what it was going to be like turning around at that 6.6 .6 mile mark. I was doing a half marathon that day and knew that, you know, the way back would require that I level up. And every once in a while, the thought popped into my head, sort of reminding me of the inevitable. And sure enough, the moment arrived. The sun pressing down onto my skin, the humidity wrapped around me like a blanket. I hit 6.6 .6 miles, turned around on A1A, and there was that headwind. But the first thing I noticed was not the force pushing back against me. No, in that moment, I felt the breeze, the coolness. It was refreshing. And there, Underneath it all was my light bulb moment. What we are presented with day in and day out is a question. It's a choice. Would the wind become my adversary? Something that, yeah, pushed me forward on the way down, but then held me back on the way up? Or would it be what pushed me forward on the way down and then cooled me off as I made my way up? And if you think that mental alteration or perspective shift uh, is just nuance or too small to matter, I suggest you give it a go when you're doing whatever your equivalent of total exertion is. Whatever your mental stressor is that pushes you uh, beyond your state of usual comfort. When you're in the middle of, let's call it hurt, whether it be physical activity or a personal situation entirely unrelated to athletics, how are you internalizing the world around you? It's become clear to me over time that winning during our most trying moments comes down to mental shifts so small that they seem almost laughable in normal conditions. But your mind will always stop you before life will. So why not put yourself in a position to win? Everything around you is trying to help you in some capacity. Allow that to be the case. Remember that what you look for, you'll find. So if you look for resistance and obstacles and adversaries, they'll be everywhere. But if you look for and seek out value, you'll see that you are surrounded by nothing but value. Even those metaphorical headwinds become hands reaching out, working to cool you off as you make your way to greater things. So understand that when they arise, those headwinds, the ones that typically hold you back, they hide within them small winds, small winds that will be the difference. The deeper one descends into chaos, the more important it is to find those victories, the ones hidden in plain view, the ones that look to many like problems, but you'll know. 
you'll know just how malleable this world around us is. The world seems to provide not definitives, but tools. So which will you pick up? What will you build with them? See, life is never happening to you. It's happening for you. So keep your eyes open, keep your feet moving, and remember that you will win, not despite the headwinds of life, but because of them. Because you've trained yourself when those around you see can't and won't to find a way, to pull from the chaos, the very thing you need most. Life gives you the canvas, but you are the one who must paint. The difficulty we face in life is not personal. If you remember this, you disarm every adversary, obstacle, every complication you'll ever face. So quick story. Recently, I was renewing a lease for my apartment. Something that usually is pretty simple, right? Only this time things were not simple. Confusion, chaos, misunderstanding after misunderstanding. I received emails and letters saying, you know, you need to provide these documents in order to renew. You need to have XYZ information submitted to us ASAP. And uh, I'm sitting here thinking, guys, you have all this info, right? I've lived here a year, same guy. Let's put two and two together. And after a while, I started to get like, truly annoyed eventually to the point of taking it personally. So I stopped what I was doing and uh, go down to the front office thinking I'm going to go scorched earth here. I really wanted to emphasize how absurd and ridiculous all this was. I opened the door and just kind of stopped in my tracks. First thing I see is a crowded room filled with tenants asking for things, making requests, looking for info. And the people that worked there were so patient and kind, running around doing their absolute best to make everyone happy and get everything done. And almost immediately I realized, Eddie, you made this about you. This is not in any way about you. Basically, I created this fallacy that because things weren't working the way I wanted them to, then there must have been some universal resistance, right? There's an idea I heard a while back that very rarely steers me wrong. It's that two things can simultaneously be true at once. So in this case, is there opportunity for these guys to tighten up a bit, bring more clarity to their operations and best practices? Yeah, certainly true. But on the other hand, was building this up as a them versus me match in my head dumb and counterproductive Yes, also true. The world will always provide adversity, right? That's not news to anyone. It's just what the world does. That adversity will take a thousand different shapes and appear an infinite number of ways. But here's the deal. Life is neutral. Things just happen. They aren't good or bad. They just exist in the ether. We as storytellers decide to put a charge into things. We decide whether it's happening to us or for us. We choose. And that's the takeaway here. There's power in remembering not to take things personally in any aspect of life. Because when we do, we actually lose our grip on reality. We become emotional and not rational. And this is visible everywhere. Right? Take rejection. For example, something we all deal with, it's not personal. The person on the other end is thinking about themselves. They're locked in on their own incentives. They're not thinking about you. And however you feel about this, it's just the truth. So assess the situation, 
Sure, maybe find some areas where you can improve and carry on. Being mistreated. Again, not about you. As the saying goes, hurt people, hurt people. Same goes for criticism and hate online. Right? Something that a lot of people truly fear. It will almost always be true that people who uh, are more accomplished than you or further along in their career trajectory won't waste time bringing you down in the comment section. No, it's people saying things hoping that their comments will get approval and attention so they can feel validated. Their actions are being carried out for, ready for this, themselves. And to misdiagnose or take it as a shot to the heart, well, that's creating a battle scenario that doesn't need to exist. It's not them versus you, it's them versus them. You're just in the crossfire. Now, does this perspective or, or point to not take things personally uh, mean that we abdicate personal responsibility? Does it mean we say, well, it's not me, it's, it's the world, so not my problem? No, of course not, right? This perspective gives you the power to do the right things and the necessary things because you understand that the problems you face are not a giant indictment of you as a person. Getting angry creates a scenario where, you know, you reallocate your, your energy from doing what's best for you to instead being mad at him or her or this group or that circumstance or the world in general. You know, bad things happen. And by the way, they happen to everyone. Everyone gets rejected at some point. Everyone gets let down by people close to them at some point. Everyone loses their way at some point. Everyone has their expectations fall short. Everyone has pushback. It's not just you. It's the world doing what the world does. And there's 8 billion of us running around operating uh, in our best interest, trying to navigate a big, crazy world that's often uh, incredibly difficult to understand. So with this perspective, right, going forward, you know, my lesson from a few weeks ago, what would I have done differently during all that chaos with the apartment? A handful of things. I'd first of all, remind myself that in the grand scheme of things, it's trivial. It's just not that important. Two, understand incentives. Right? These folks aren't trying to make things hard for me. They're trying to do their jobs well so they can live their best lives, which brought their attention to other things, it happens. And three, when you're calm, you can actually solve the problems at hand. When you don't stack your problems up to look like adversaries working against you, when you instead see them as merely a challenge or puzzle to be solved, life starts to look a lot different. It just feels different to walk around as though life is on your side as though hardship is nothing more than the water necessary for the seed to grow. As though all those challenges you face are opportunities being presented to you. Because I'm not sure you can simultaneously fight and solve. I think one of our most important decisions is to select one. You can make the rejection an opponent, the criticism a rival, you can make the disorder your nemesis, or you can realize that all of it falls squarely into the box that is life. Pieces to be taken out one by one so that you can construct the ideal. Life comes down to the advantages that exist all around us, the choices we make to live freely with the wind at our backs or confined by the walls we build around ourselves. And sure, your current obstacles might be because of decisions you've made, maybe even decisions you wish you could take back. But the current moment right now in this second is neutral. It does not hold a grudge or have an agenda. Now, right now, is simply right now. In the same way that two plus two is four. Four is not good or bad. It doesn't want you to win or lose. It's just four. 
same goes for the crossroads before you. And that puts the onus entirely on you to decide what you will make it all mean. Will you slow things down to find clarity? Will you open your eyes to see the value? Because look, there will always be a delta between reality and the stories we tell ourselves about reality. That's just how human beings work. It's how we've managed to survive for millennia. So understand that and gift yourself the narratives that bring you closer to the place you want to be. The road before you will be challenging, not because it's pushback is personal, but because amidst the resistance, you'll find the components you need to live your very best life. Peter Drucker has said that what gets measured gets improved. And this insight's been incredibly valuable to me over the years. I want to explain why. Until you measure something, you're operating in somewhat of a black box. You're essentially guessing, aiming at targets you can't see, which ultimately means you're leaving life up to chance. But once you begin to gauge your progress in a specified area, you now have information to work with. You have an increased sense of awareness and the ability to focus. Which, as I've said before, and believe wholeheartedly, what you focus on becomes your reality. So here's a quick example that I think adequately uh, paints a picture here of what I'm talking about. Uh, way back when I first started my business, I was uh, chatting with a friend about wanting to grow my YouTube subscribers, add value to as many people as I possibly could with my work. Back then it was all YouTube. That was the crux of my business. And so the first question he asked, he goes, just out of curiosity, how many subscribers join the channel daily? And I realized in that moment, you know, I don't know. I knew the total amount, like I kept tabs on that, but not the sort of daily fluctuation, how much grew on Monday versus Friday, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and this guy, he had a tracker. He's very big on that. Basically a sheet with the most important things that he's trying to change in his life. And every day when he would wake up, he'd record a quick measurement in each of those categories. And my first thought was, eh, you know, that's a little over the top. It's a little extra. But hey, one of my favorite mantras is that you are your own experiment and I was happy to try something new that you know, could have a positive impact. And so I did, I started uh, recording daily the net subscribers that join the Your World Within community. And what I found was incredible. They say it's the simple things that make the greatest difference in our lives and this would certainly be no exception, right? First and foremost, just seeing that number every day kept growth at the forefront of my mind. It kept me aware and excited and thinking through that lens as if I were on a journey or mission to outperform the me of yesterday, right? If on some random day you grow 30% more than you usually do, it's only normal to see that and ask, well, why can't this happen every day? Why can't this be my reality? And next, and, and probably more obvious, it armed me with the tools to tactically improve my performance. Those daily metrics helped me find critical answers, arrive at important conclusions. You know, what days of the week and weeks of the year have the greatest impact? What trends lead to increased viewership? My daily average subscriber count is X. I wonder what it would take to bring it to Y. Right? And so basically, instead of just showing up every day with my fingers crossed and hoping I'd hit it out of the park, I had a more informed approach. It's like taking a blindfold off. And all of this prompted by writing one little number down in the morning. The more I did this, the more it became obvious that it should be implemented in other aspects of my life. If this is important to me, if I say with conviction this is an area I want to improve, how could I afford to not know the extent of its growth? 
And now I do track the handful of things I'm most invested in growing because those will be most impacted by my giving them attention. There's a saying that what you water grows. Well, your focus and your attention is what will water the seed, what will give it life. If you're looking to lose weight, but you never look at the scale, you're hurting yourself, right? And you might say, well, I don't wanna be all about the numbers. Right? It's a lifestyle change. And I certainly agree. The point is not to track every single step you make. It's to realize how often we operate blindly. It's to show you that with 100% certainty, your increased awareness and attention dedicated to any pursuit will make you more effective in bringing about your desired result. Knowing your daily progress keeps you in the game. It keeps you excited and also arms you with the tools to make the necessary changes. See, we are brilliant creatures capable of incredible things, but it's critical that we position ourselves so that we can win the game. It's critical that we not only look but see. To be simplified, to condense life down to only what's important and to monitor those things that are important to you will give you a tremendous advantage. And again, this is basic stuff, but we skip the basic stuff because we think the big changes come from complexity. They don't. They come from choosing a target and working to get closer and closer to its bullseye. Like Greg McCune says in Essentialism, growth often has nothing to do with the acquisition of more. Sometimes it's about eliminating the things we don't need and focusing on that which we do. Now I'm suggesting we take it one step further and measure our growth as we take those meaningful things into the great unknown. Life can be challenging, that's no secret. So why not arm ourselves with every advantage available to us? Why not keep yourself excited and invested and knowledgeable? Often we look around at what we don't have and think, man, I could never have what they have. I could never do what he or she does. The reality is they identified what matters and brought it to life one small step at a time. And guess what? You can do the same. It's not a miracle you need, it's awareness. So here's to keeping your eyes open to not only looking but seeing and in doing so getting results from the opportunity we otherwise would walk right by. The other day, I heard someone say that they've found some of the most important things in their life in places where they weren't supposed to find them which is interesting to me. One, because that seems to happen a lot. And two, because it's like, who creates the parameters around what we're supposed to do? Who sets the rules to begin with? You know, I'm continuously blown away by our tendency to create imaginary walls and then live within them to build steel bars around ourselves that separate the now from future opportunity. In one of the first videos I ever made, I talked about this nagging feeling of discomfort that occurred uh, right after I left the corporate world and started my own business. And at that point, to call it a business was giving myself a lot of credit. I was basically just starting to make videos and put them out on social media. But I would run in the middle of the day, right? That was my thing, right through Boston, along the Charles River. I loved running, but I couldn't help feeling this guilt, like I wasn't supposed to, like I was doing the wrong thing, doing what I was taught not to do. 
My whole life, I learned that you go to school or work during the day. That's the right thing. In a decade removed, I've grown and I've learned. I know how crazy it sounds now. But it took me a long time to even enjoy it and not feel like some deviant who was leaving everything he'd worked for up to that point to go and fail spectacularly. Right? The supposed to followed me around like a shadow, constantly trying to pull me back in. Freedom to me is separating oneself from this exact sentiment. It's doing what's best for you, exploring your own worldview, blazing, as the saying goes, your own trail. Because you'll find very few supposed tos there. I think this is a microcosm of a greater truth. The most important things we do in life our pivotal moments, our epiphanies are found where we weren't supposed to find them. Because what we're supposed to do is very rarely methodically thought out. It's simply the norm. It's marching orders. It's what the crowd is doing. It's what will help us blend in. And it's interesting, as I've pushed further and further into life, I've come to believe that rarely is what's best all one thing or all another. It's working to find a balance that supports your ideal life trajectory, right? That balance will lean substantially more one way or another, depending on who you are and what's important to you. And so I'm not suggesting one always needs to be different or if something is common, it's wrong. No, thousands of years of evolution and societal stressors have in many ways narrowed down for us what's effective and efficient helped us survive. And to dismiss this outright is obviously counterproductive, but it does explain why any break from these norms physically hurts. We associate them with survival. And here lies the divide between surviving, which we are supposed to do, and excelling, which is to embark upon a different game altogether. Survival is mitigating risk. Excelling is hunting down the opportunity. Survival is blending in. Excelling is asking, what about me is unique and how can I dive into that fully? Survival is not having to innovate on any large scale because the instructions are clear and laid out for you. Excelling is asking, now that I know the rules, how can I bend and maybe even break them so that I can improve my life and the lives of those around me? And I'll continue with the same example because I know a lot of folks find themselves in a similar situation now. I wasn't supposed to deviate from my previous life trajectory, my education, my career track, my 401k, but I did. And I found something I otherwise would never have, an ability to work on what I enjoy and share that with others. I wasn't supposed to leave home, the Northeast. The most important people in my life live up there. But I found comfort, peace, and new beginnings down here that I never would have experienced. I wasn't supposed to do many of the things I'm doing today. It was a genuine curiosity and a willingness to chase down what's meaningful. And the beautiful thing is, anyone can do that. Every single one of us can detach and depart from the supposed to's in our lives. And hey, maybe some of them should be there. Maybe some are adding value and stability that you need and maybe even cherish. But I can promise some of them aren't. And it's worth a look. It's worth thinking about those things. Where can we be a little braver, a little more courageous? Where can we venture outside the scope of what we've subconsciously deemed every day life? I love the notion that there's always more in you. You just need to give yourself permission to pursue it. 
It only makes sense that no journey begins until we give it the green light. The world is yours once you give yourself permission to pursue it. So what are you conceding? What have you accepted as fact that upon further review you might find to be fiction? There's a world of infinite opportunity waiting for you. Just past your acceptance of the way things are. Just beyond all those supposed to. What's the difference between paying a fee and paying a fine? The answer to this question may not be as small or insignificant as we're inclined to believe. I recently picked up the book, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It lays out some uh, valuable concepts and ideas about investing and managing our finances, growing our wealth. But there's one idea that I wanted to share because Yeah, from an investing standpoint, it's important, critical even. But it's relevant to so much more. And I think an understanding of it will help us in many aspects of life. So first, let's start with the financial piece, and then we'll sort of grow the metaphor, right? Because Housel talks about how we should look at investing in the market. And one of the hardest things for us to deal with is the market's volatility. And it's difficult for us to invest our hard-earned money and then see the market go, let's say, for example, down 20%. Like seeing that huge dip in our investment, that's not fun. Right? Everyone knows that. That can be nerve-wracking. And it dissuades a lot of people from investing or keeping their money in when they should. It ultimately uh, keeps them from getting the returns available to them. Right? But here's the point he makes. He says, those people who see that volatility as a fee and not a fine, are more inclined to win in the long term. Understanding that market returns are never free, they demand a price. And that price is the roller coaster ride that we all have to deal with. That is the market. It's the ups and downs and highs and lows. That volatility is the cost of admission. And if you understand that, you're more inclined to stay calm. Keep your long-term vision you're more than likely to come out on top. On the other hand, if when that turbulence arrives, you know, the sudden crashes, the ups and downs, and you see it as a fine, as this terrible thing that's happening to a punishment, you're more likely to act emotionally, to be reactive and make decisions that aren't in your best interest. To drive the point home, he mentions Disneyland, for example. The fee is $100. And people will gladly pay that fee because, you know, they get that uh, great experience with their family, their kids that they'll have for the rest of their lives. That $100 isn't a fine. It's not a punishment. It's an intentional, deliberate trade of one thing for another. And if you were to look at it as a fine, you'd never get to enjoy that experience. If you thought that $100 was a punishment, Uh, It just wouldn't be the same, right? And so why do I bring all this up? Because I'm a firm believer that the best things in life all come with that price or a fee, as Housel states. But I also think we sometimes have a tendency to look at that cost, that very same cost of admission, as a fine, as a problem. When really, no, it's just trading some turbulence now for a reward a little bit uh, down the road. Sometimes the right thing is the hard thing, the uncomfortable thing. With dividends, it will pay so long as we understand that it's opening the door to something greater. Leaving a situation you know is not good for you hurts, right? We've all been there. We all know this in some capacity. But it's not a punishment or even a bad thing, right? That discomfort associated with walking away is a fee that will enable you to live a more aligned life in the very near future. Or let's say you're building something meaningful, something you care deeply about, but it's just you, you and the idea. There is no validation, certainly no external reward, not yet. And continuing forward in those moments is hard. 
It's taxing. Emotionally draining, even. But this feeling, again, isn't a punishment. It's not a fine. It's the fee. It's the cost of admission to bring something into life that wasn't there. Life's greatest moments are expensive. It's just, are you going to pay the fee to bring it about or the cost of regret at a different time? And you get the point, right? You can take this and apply it to so many things. Falling down, criticism, feeling lost, having to start from the bottom. These things are not fines, they are fees. They are price tags. And so often, the initial price is a bargain compared to what we'll get back. We just need to stop perceiving their mere existence as the world working against us. No, these are opportunities in disguise. It's easy to walk by the important things, to dismiss the uncomfortable things. The harsh truth is that our greatest opportunities are often intertwined in our distress. That's why so many people walk away from the things that will make their lives better. That's why so many people pull their money from the market uh, when it takes a dive. So many people walk away from a project or idea when things get challenging. Or conversely, it's why so many people do nothing at all. They stay in situations they aren't happy with and know they need to change because the fee to get from point A to point B feels too steep. But I think the value is in comparing the discomfort, the cost, the fee to what it's going to bring you down the road because often it's a bargain. We need to remember that what it will ultimately provide has life-changing potential. Understand that resistance is not a fine. It is not the world telling you no. It's life asking you, hey, do you really want this? Because if you do, it's yours. So long as you sign the dotted line and pay the price, most people will be dissuaded by this. Most people will turn and walk away, but most people also leave a hell of a lot on the table. And I don't want that for you. You don't want that for you. The world we live in is one of abundance. So when life pushes back, understand that it's merely positioning you to move beyond your limits, to redefine your worldview. And while admission isn't free, it's well worth price. Find something to make yours. I connect every few months with some of my good friends to uh, strategize, kind of reflect back on the previous quarter, plan for the new one uh, with each of our businesses, kind of share ideas, stuff like that. And I was chatting with my friend Keith uh, about life before he found success in what he's doing now, the struggle and the turbulence he faced, as well as ultimately his decision, and that's entirely what it was, to turn things around. And I've talked about his backstory before, so I'm not going to get too much into it, but essentially he grew up in a very negative environment, dealt with a ton of adversity, Uh, but got through it. Started his own national business, installing and repairing commercial pizza ovens, and the guy's just crushing it. And, you know, our conversation in that moment wasn't so much about uh, the doing, it was more on the overcoming and how mentally we had to recreate ourselves to have any chance of moving beyond what we knew. I've talked about it a little before. Kids are simply not taught in school how to thrive how to build, how to ask more of themselves and the world, uh, they're taught to follow instructions, to do what they need to do in order to pass the exam, to progress to the next level. And there's a gray area, because I'm not saying this is totally valueless, but I am saying that anything beyond that requires a reworking of sorts. You ask anyone who stepped out of that cycle, and they'll tell you the mental and psychological shift that needed to take place Uh, It was almost overwhelming, right? It's a lot, but it's imperative. I recently looked up the word entrepreneurship, and this is the definition. 
The activity of setting up a business or businesses taking on financial risk in the hope of profit. And in my mind, it is the risk precisely that's challenging, that brings us so much pain, but also contains within it the reward. It's one of the craziest dilemmas we face. You know, you'll have to endure some of the worst times of your life, but because of that, you'll get to experience highs that would otherwise have been almost completely improbable. We have to rework the thinking that says discomfort equals run away. It's like, no, discomfort equals the price of something better. And sure, it's by no means mandatory, but it's where the upside lives. You have to train yourself to step out into the chaos with the expectation of taming it. And yeah, everything could go wrong, but also everything could go right. And just imagine, imagine what that would look like. That possibility alone validates the risk. We just need to convince ourselves. And that risk, by the way, is not just financial. In fact, most of the time it's not. It takes uh, a variety of shapes in our lives. You run the race, you risk losing. You go up and talk to the girl, you risk rejection. You pick up and move somewhere new. You risk winding up somewhere you don't want to be. And maybe temporarily things do fall apart, but maybe you win the race. Maybe you find the love of your life. Maybe you relocate to the happiest place you've ever called home. Calculated risk is the beginning of everything that matters. And so back to the convo, we were talking about the different risks we've taken, how some chapters were fun, some were challenging, and some were both. And how, for me, there was even, from time to time, a conversation where I was asking myself whether it was really worth it. You know, when you're uncomfortable, the mind wants to do one thing, get rid of the discomfort. And I had to convince myself remind myself that I'm someone who risks good to pursue great. Risk hurts. And somewhere in that conversation was when Keith said he remembers the exact point the risk became worth it. The discomfort became easier to manage. We're so used to taking orders, to playing scared, that the incentive just wasn't there until, Keith's words, it became mine. The most invigorating thing he ever did was find a pursuit to call his own. That's powerful. His business injected him with a new energy and in essence, a new life because he suddenly had a stake in the game. And I think that's what so many of us in so many areas are missing. The risk appears bigger when it's not counterbalanced by something meaningful. So find something to make yours. The simplicity there is beautiful. Complex ideas expressed in simple ways are always worth holding on to, right? We are programmed to lose because we are programmed to live according to someone else's standard, to think small, to ask ourselves, how do we not screw up? But when you can step outside that little self-imposed circle and instead ask yourself, what's something I can create that is my own, something I care about, that I can nurture, invest a part of me into, that's when life really starts paying dividends. You're not existing, you're living. Or as I've recently discussed, you're empowering yourself to not just sit in the room, but be in the room fully. I use entrepreneurship as the model for this discussion because that's been such a huge part of my life where I've been injecting my time and attention and yeah, risk. But the point is not that everyone needs to stop what they're doing and become an entrepreneur. That's one path of many, obviously. The point is that there is a risk reward dynamic in entrepreneurship that we should all understand, extract and inject into our own lives where it best applies. We've learned to settle in so many ways that we must know there is tremendous value in asking what is it in my life I want to invest in? Make mine. 
give myself the opportunity to experience the excitement of defining the things I care about and watching them grow. Right? Whether your current arena is entrepreneurship or motherhood, fatherhood, academics, a particular relationship, some combination of these or anything else, to make magic out of the mundane requires we first make it ours. We take ownership, responsibility for the journey. We accept the risk and chase down the rewards. You can do amazing things when you realize what you're capable of and commit to its manifestation. So in a world where yes, we are conditioned to fail, step out from those subtle shackles of learned helplessness. You are anything but helpless. It's just that you've yet to reach out and pull your dreams into your orbit. You've yet to put a stake in the ground and say this matters and it's time to see it through. Because once you do that, the good stuff begins. Every run tells a tale. All those streets, sidewalks and paths paint a picture. Each footstep enshrines forever a moment in time that comes together to comprise the now. From my time in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, it was asking, why not? Why not find out if I could be a little faster than yesterday? My first dance with the clock. Waking up early, running up Snake Pond Road. Sun shining in my face, inhaling that crisp morning air. It was running along the canal where the distance was precisely mapped out in paint on the ground below tattooing a path that seemed to go for as long as I wanted to push forward. It taught me that we could do amazing things when we decided to. That we have more in us than we could ever imagine. In a sense, Cape Cod was my eyes opening up to the idea that what life gives us is directly correlated to what we ask of ourselves. So ask for a lot. In Boston, it was exploration. It was pushing myself harder and further, but also stretching my worldview wider, a time for transformation. It was beginning to see the mundane, the commonplace for the wolves in sheep's clothing that they are. I began exploring city streets, like I simultaneously began exploring life's possibility. I saw how taking new routes often came with two distinct components. One, an unsettling, nervous feeling in my stomach, and two, an eventual gratitude for finding the courage to go there. The world will never tell you to go where you have not yet gone. It will never assign you a map and hand you keys, a plane, or a bus ticket. That desire must be cultivated internally. Boston was me realizing the unknown wasn't a border keeping me in. It was a hand extended. In Roanoke, Virginia, it was, in a sense, a rebirth. Moving away post-college. Everything was new, it was foreign, but everything was exciting. I had to learn who I was in new surroundings with new people. My Nike running shoes took me through woods, down side streets, into the heart of downtown. I ran and I ran and I ran. Because with all that change, it was one of the few constants in my life. It brought me to the realization that with so many moving pieces, so many things shuffling in and out, 
there are parts of me that are non-negotiable. That in life, it's okay and even necessary to change. But one should never lose themselves in that process. They call Roanoke the star city of the South. For the giant glowing star that lights up on the mountain overlooking the city. Perhaps a reminder to never lose that North Star in our own lives. In South Florida, it was about connecting the dots. It had been relentlessly doing, now it was seeing. Seeing myself as that person, as someone ready for more, worthy of a spot at the table, capable of creating monumental change. Those soft sand runs reinforce the notion that I get stronger when the world moves under my feet. Those hundreds of thousands of footsteps under the hot sun reiterated that I'm willing to do what is often deemed unnecessary or even over the top. And lastly, living in the luxury of no winter reminded me to appreciate the sun, the perks, the advantages and the victories we collect along the way but to never take them for granted, to be ready. Because life's winters don't always wait until after fall to show up at your doorstep. See, every step we take is a lesson. Every street, sidewalk, and path is part of a story. And sometimes we don't understand until we look back at the chapter. We don't get it until we have the luxury of hindsight. I didn't know that I'd look back on Snake Pond Road as sacred ground, as a launch pad to everything that would come next. No, in the moment, it was nothing more than a temporary escape from a world that felt bigger than me. I didn't know I'd see the city of Boston as the place that taught me to question the normalcy of everyday life. To show me that one could be moving awfully fast and still going nowhere at all. No, in the moment, it was merely a decision to dip my toe in the water, to entertain the curiosity and sense of adventure that always seemed a few feet ahead. I had no idea Roanoke, Virginia would be where I learned that as Emerson said, to be yourself in a world, constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. That there are non-negotiables and shining down above all the noise and intricacies of everyday life exists the path and the resources to become who you were meant to be. No, in the moment I was simply stepping off my branch and landing somewhere new. I didn't know South Florida would be my consistent reminder to level up, to hold tightly that intersection of love and value, to find gratitude for what I have and maintain faith in bringing about what has not yet materialized. No, at the time, I was taking my life, my business, and my running shoes to warmer weather. You may not see it now, but your path, the one that led you to today, is the right path. You are exactly where you need to be for the beginning of your next adventure. But here's the thing. You, you must keep lacing up your shoes. Keep getting up in the morning and chasing those sunrises. Keep dreaming, growing. Keep your eyes, ears, and heart open. Because the world has so much to give you but you have to allow your feet to carry you there. You have to give yourself permission to take it all in. The normalcy of right now, down the road will end up being anything but normal. These steps are the steps that make you who you are, so own them, believe in them, and most importantly, keep taking them.
a substantial amount of life comes down to self-trust, to believing in yourself, right? But here's the thing, it's not blind belief. It's not toxic positivity where you close your eyes, cross your fingers, shut the world off and just assume things will work out because you're entitled to a great result. No, what I'm referring to is uh, an active and deliberate trusting of yourself to learn, to make the necessary adjustments and to keep moving forward. When we have faith in our ability to step forward and improve simultaneously, there is no defeat. When you know you won't stop until you land where you want to land, then limitations become a choice. Success in any capacity is a you thing, not an outside thing. And this popped into my head a few days ago during, uh, of all things, a game of ax throwing. So quick story from last weekend, a friend of mine um, and I, after a day of working on the podcast, went down to uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, to this ax throwing place, which is, it's random, but it's a, it's a great time, simple concept. There's this uh, giant target and you take turns throwing little axes at the target, basically uh, darts, right? If you think along those lines. And there were eight of us in the group. They divide you into two teams of four and you play various games until the end, right? The end, there's this final session where it's every person for themselves. It's like a free for all. Each person gets three rounds to throw axes at the target and uh, whoever has the best score wins. So think of the target just in a, a traditional way, right? The bullseye or the little point in the middle is worth five. Then the next smallest circle outside of that is four, then three, then two, and then the biggest circle along the edge is worth one, right? So whatever you hit with the ax, that's the point you get, except they put these two little blue dots on the top third of the circle. And they say, if you can hit one of these blue dots, you get 10 points. So high risk, but certainly high reward. And my friend and I, super competitive, right? He looks at me, starts telling me how he's already got this in the bag. And I'm like, all right, we'll see. Uh, it, and it's been arguable, but I probably had been the more consistent um, of both of us up to that point in the night. Nothing fancy, just straight away aiming at the middle, aiming for those bullseyes and, and fours. Not even attempting to go for those, you know, hard to reach blue dots, no need straight up the middle. Okay, and here's why this is important. We step out to take our first shots of the, of the finale here. My friend goes first, immediately hits one of those little blue dots. Boom, already, I'm down 10 points. So what do I do? I completely leave my strategy and I start thinking, no, I'm behind. I can't let this happen. I spent uh, my next nine shots and the only nine shots I had, right? Uh, trying to hit those blue dots and missing every time, just get killed, right? He won handedly. And then I realized uh, when the scores were read out at the end, that if I just ignored everything my buddy had done, and stayed true to my game, aimed for the center of the board, averaged 3.5 or four points a throw, I would have won, and by a substantial margin. But I let the outside world impact my strategy. I started chasing those long shot blue dots when I knew they were a distraction. Right. Now, I'm sure the last thing you expected to hear today was the recap of an ax throwing contest. But uh, if you bear with me, there's value here, right? So let's step beyond the ax throwing. Let's take it up a level. Let's talk about when you know what's best for you, you know where you want to be and what's working, but you're pulled out of your lane because of what someone else says or does. You hear him or her over there accomplish something great. You look in the mirror and go, man, I haven't accomplished anything like that, right? Maybe I need to change what I'm doing, my approach. Maybe I'm wrong. See, and the beauty of that little game was that it reminded me that there will always be outside circumstances 
trying to redirect my course. But we have to trust in ourselves that we are doing what's best. We have to know our own game and our own strengths. Now, don't conflate this with the stubbornness. It's not about never adjusting. No, we need to adjust. But adjust when it's best for you. Not simply because other people are taking a different approach. Right? It's hard to stay consistent uh, with the world pushing other options consistently, right? People finding success in various ways, taking other paths, talking about their incredible strategies and how great X, Y, and Z is. But it's all noise. You have to trust you. And again, not blind faith, but an understanding of who you are and a willingness to continue to grow with every step forward. There has to be some element of understanding that, sure, things will get challenging, life will push back, but that doesn't mean you are wrong or in over your head. It's a compounding of little actions and trust in yourself. If you can do that, the world remains yours. It's day by day, or in my example, throw by throw, knowing your bullseye and aiming steady up the middle. We all know how hard it is to see results before they exist. The mind tries to find every example out there depicting why you're wrong, why the finish line is too far away. Life is constantly creating off ramps, saying, hey, if you don't want it that bad, or you're unsure of yourself, here's a way out, come with me. Right, it's constantly sowing seeds of doubt, which is why we must dig deep for that strength. Life is a game of you versus you. If those around you win, good for them. And if they lose, well, hey, wish them well on the next go around. But none of it has any bearing on who you are and the race you're running. Are you going to show up for you? Are you going to be your biggest fan when it takes every single part of you to keep going? Don't let the loudest voices in the room dissuade you from what you know to be right. Don't let the blue dots hinder your direct line to the bullseye, right? Block out that noise, block out the distractions and do what is required of you. Win your race, because that's the only finish line of value. Walk your path, because that will bring you where you need to be. And when you question the pursuit, remember what you've overcome, all the steps that brought you to right now, and how, yeah, maybe they weren't flashy or over the top, but they were consistent. They've given life to the present moment. What you do is succeed. What you do is overcome. Just don't lose your bullseye.